I'm Brittany Lewis with Forbes Breaking News. In remarks on the Senate floor Wednesday, Senator Bernie Sanders condemned the Bipartisan Chips Act. The independent senator from Vermont said that the legislation was, quote, massive corporate welfare for enormously profitable multinational corporations. Senator Sanders introduced an amendment to prevent stock buybacks and protect the rights of workers to unionize to companies that receive federal money. His amendment was blocked by Senator Maria Cantwell. Uh, I have heard time and again my Republican colleagues and a number of Democrats voice their serious concern about the deficit and our national debt. We are told that because of the deficit, that at a time when we have the highest rate of childhood poverty of almost any major country on earth, we cannot extend the child tax credit to help working parents and substantially reduce childhood poverty. At a time when over 600,000 Americans are homeless and some 18 million families are spending half of their incomes on the high cost of housing, we are told over and over again that because of the deficit, we cannot build the low-income and affordable housing we desperately need. At a time when millions of senior citizens of this country desperately need help to go to a dentist, because their teeth are rotting in their mouths. They can't afford hearing aids. They can't afford eyeglasses. We are told that we cannot afford to expand Medicare because of the deficit. At a time when the average family in this country is spending $15,000 a year on child care, an unimaginable amount of money for a working family, we are told that we cannot reform a dysfunctional child care system because of the deficit. At a time when some 70 million Americans are uninsured or underinsured, we are told that we cannot guarantee health care to all Americans as a human right like virtually every other major country does because of the deficit. In other words, Mr. President, despite the fact that half of the people in our country today are living paycheck to paycheck, despite the fact that half of our seniors live on incomes of 25,000 or less, despite the fact that we have more income and wealth inequality today than we've had in 100 years, where three billionaires own more wealth than the bottom half of America. Despite all of that, whenever it comes to protecting the needs of low-income or working families, I hear over and over again, we just cannot afford to do that because of the deficit. Well, Mr. President, guess what? All of that profound and serious concerns about the deficit fades away when it comes to providing a $76 billion blank check to the highly profitable microchip industry with no protections at all for the American taxpayer. Somehow, the deficit is of great concern when it comes to providing help to working families, to low-income Americans, to children, to seniors. But it's not a concern when you provide massive corporate welfare for enormously profitable multinational corporations. I guess, Mr. President, when the semiconductor industry spends $19 million on lobbying this year alone, and when Intel spends $100 million on lobbying and campaign contributions over the past 20 years, when that industry says, jump, the response from Congress is, how high? That is what a political system dominated by big money looks like. The people in this country who desperately need help 
can't get it. The corporations that are making huge profits and the CEOs who are making exorbitant compensation packages get everything they need and more. In other words, it appears that the deep concerns about the deficit are rather selective. Now, Mr. President, after I finish my remarks, I will give my colleagues a chance to prove me wrong. I'll be raising a budget point of order against this bill because it increases the deficit by over $79 billion, with $76 billion of that money going to the microchip industry with no strings attached. Mr. President, let me be very clear. There is no doubt that there is a global shortage of microchips and semiconductors, which is making it harder for manufacturers to produce the cars, cell phones, household appliances, and electronic equipment that we need. And that is why I fully support efforts to expand U.S. microchip production. But the question we should be asking is this. Should American taxpayers provide the microchip industry with a blank check of over $76 billion at a time when semiconductor companies are making tens of billions of dollars in profit right now and paying the head of Intel some $170 million a year in compensation? And I think the answer to that question is a resounding no. That is why, at the conclusion of my remarks, I will be asking unanimous consent to attach an amendment to this legislation. This amendment is simple and straightforward. It would prevent microchip companies from receiving grants under this legislation unless they agreed not to buy back their own stock. Not complicated. Now, this is rather amazing. This is really quite incredible and tells you where we are as a nation politically. Over the past decade, semiconductor companies have spent nearly $250 billion, 70% of their profits, not on research and development, not on building new microchip plants in America, what this bill is presumably about, but on buying back their own stock to enrich their wealthy shareholders. Let me repeat, the industry that is asking for $76 billion of corporate welfare today over the past decade spent $250 billion, 70% of their profits, not on research and development, not on building new microchip plants in America, but on buying back their own stock to enrich their wealthy stockholders. Apparently, they just couldn't find $76 billion of their own money to invest in new plants in America. They need the taxpayers of this country to do it for them. Do any of my colleagues really believe we should allow microchip companies to receive $76 billion in taxpayer assistance without a ban on stock buybacks? Under my amendment, microchip companies would not be allowed to receive taxpayer assistance unless they agreed that they would not repeal existing, existing collective bargaining agreements and would remain neutral in any union organizing effort. Do any of my colleagues believe that we should be handing out corporate welfare to profitable corporations who are engaged in busting unions? Under my agreement, microchip companies would not be able to receive $76 billion in taxpayer assistance unless they agreed not to outsource jobs overseas. Now, I heard my colleague from Indiana speak a moment ago about the crisis in the microchip industry, how we are producing a smaller and smaller amount, but he forgot to mention, somehow forgot to mention, that over the last 20 years, the microchip industry has shut down over 780 manufacturing plants and other establishments in the U.S. and eliminated 150,000 American jobs while moving most of its production overseas. In other words, what taxpayers are doing are rebuilding an industry that was destroyed by the industry itself by going abroad in search of more profit. Under my amendment, microchip companies 
would be prevented from receiving taxpayer assistance unless they agree to issue warrants or equity stakes to the federal government. Now, I happen to believe in industrial policy. I think it makes sense for the government and private sector to be working together when it is mutually beneficial. If private companies, however, are going to benefit from generous taxpayer subsidies, $76 billion, the financial gains made by these companies must be shared with the American people, not just wealthy shareholders. Does that sound really unreasonable? If these guys are going to make huge profits based on this investment, don't you think maybe the taxpayers of this country who gave them the money might be able to get some of those benefits back? The microchip industry today is worth about $680 billion. By 2030, that market, the market for microchips, is expected to grow to a trillion dollars. Do any of my colleagues really believe that if microchip companies make a profit as a direct result of these federal grants, which is extremely likely, the taxpayer of this country, taxpayers do not have a right to get a reasonable return on that investment. And Mr. President, let, is, let us be clear, none of this is a radical idea. All of those provisions that I just articulated were included in the CARES Act that passed the Senate by a vote of 96 to 0. In other words, every senator here has already voted for these provisions. Now, Mr. President, uh, I have heard recently some of my colleagues who are saying, don't worry, we have imposed, quote, unquote, strong guidelines to this bill. Well, Mr. President, let me respectfully disagree. The so-called guardrails would do nothing to prevent microchip companies from outsourcing a single job abroad. In fact, the so-called guardrails would not even force Intel to divest all of the money they have put into semiconductor companies in China. The so-called guardrails would do nothing to protect taxpayers or to stop microchip companies from union busting. Yes, Mr. President, I understand some language has been inserted into this bill that would prohibit microchip companies from using federal grants to buy back their own stock. But let's be clear, this language is totally meaningless. Under this legislation, companies will still be able to use the enormous profits that they are making to buy back their own stocks. Bottom line, let us rebuild the U.S. microchip industry. I believe that. But let us do it in a way that benefits all of our society, not just a handful of wealthy, profitable, and powerful corporations. Mr. President, in 1968, Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. said, and I quote, the problem is that we all too often have socialism for the rich and rugged free enterprise capitalism for the poor, end quote. I am afraid that what Dr. King said 54 years ago was accurate back then, and as we can see by this legislation today, massive subsidies for the rich and the powerful while we continue to turn our backs on working families. What King said then is even more accurate now. Mr. President, I ask unanimous consent that it be in order to call up amendment number 5145, that the amendment be considered and agreed to, and that the motion to reconsider be considered, made, and laid upon the table without intervening action or debate. Is there objection? The Senator from Washington. I object. Objection is heard. Mr. President, I raise the point of order that the pending measure violate Section 4106 of the concurrent resolution on the budget for fiscal year 2018, H. Conrez 71 of the 115th Congress, the Senate pay as you go point of order. The Senator from Washington. Pursuant to the Section 904 of the Congressional Budget Act of 1974, I move to waive all applicable sections of that act and any other applicable budget points of order for the purpose of the pending bill and I ask for the yeas and nays. Is there a sufficient second? There appears to be. The yeas and nays are ordered.